Okay, I got you. Okay, I think you're good. Did you, you need to turn Oh, it's 10. Mind. All right. Everyone quiet. Uh, I'm going to be lecturing to you today about uh, uh, selecting lipid lowering um, pharmacotherapies. Um, uh, lipids and cholesterol is something that I've studied uh, for a very long time, actually about the past 10 years, and it's been a topic that's been uh, near and dear to me. I've uh, studied it uh, both clinically uh, from a standpoint of investigational medicine and in the laboratory um, as well. There's a huge overlap uh, with um, uh, the increase of cholesterol and coronary artery disease and that with obesity. And as you all have heard, you know, obesity, depending exactly on how you define it, um, can be uh, well over 50% of the population, probably closer to 65% of the population um, now. And so this is, uh, the incidence of this uh, disease is actually is, is, uh, goes up all the time. Um, and that's despite the best efforts as clinicians to, uh, to keep it down. Um, so this, this is actually a pretty critical lecture, uh, just because so many people are, are burdened with uh, atherosclerosis. So I, I encourage you to, uh, to pay close attention to this, because it's, it's more than likely, actually, it's essentially 100% certitude that you're going to be con uh, in contact with patients that are affected with uh, hypercholesterolemia. Um, I've studied this um, uh, from three different perspectives, and from pharmacology, what they call the big three, uh, both at the university setting at uh, a drug research a setting, a commercial drug research setting at Pfizer, Inc., and then finally uh, with the Food and Drug Administration. Um, and before I actually uh, start digging into this, I want to tell you a little bit about what this is in case you haven't seen this title before. That's the PharmD uh, title. So this is a, this is a doctorate that was uh, developed within about the past 50 years or so when it was predicted, and correctly so, that one day the number of drugs and drug-drug interactions would overwhelm physicians and nurses in the hospital setting. So this is a clinical pharmacy degree. It's a, it's a doctor of pharmacy degree. Um, it's, uh, it, it, th this degree is, is similar in the sense to the medical degree is that after the four-year program, you can go specialize in uh, just about uh, any specialty the physicians can. And my, my specialty in particular was that in vascular medicine where I went to I, I use it to go um, do research. Um, anyway, let's uh, get started. Whoops. There we go. So I've, uh, I've detailed a few of the abbreviations here in this first slide. Um, and these are, these are abbreviations which you're going to want to familiarize yourself with. Um, you're gonna, you can't run away from them. Uh, the objectives here, um, you guys have. They're just as stated. Um, hyperlipidemia is something which is a broad term, which includes uh, hypercholesterolemia. It refers to elevated blood levels of lipoproteins, which can include uh, cholesterol, triglycerides, and uh, phospholipids. And the abnormalities can include one or more of the following, uh, elevated LDL, elevated uh, triglycerides. And triglycerides aren't actually a form of cholesterol, which is why the slide is titled hyperlipidemia. Uh, triglycerides are a form of fat storage in the body. Uh, reduced high-density lipoprotein, which is, as you know, the good cholesterol, and elevated total cholesterol. Um, the standard, the levels of these drugs are set uh, by the National Cholesterol Education Program, NCEP, uh, adult treatment panel, which is on its third revision now. Uh, CAD, or coronary artery disease, refers to plaque occlusion in the arteries and the heart. Um, and approximately 50% of American adults have um, high levels of uh, LDL. Unfortunately, according to pharmacoepidemiologists, um, less than 50% of the patients who do have high LDLs are receiving lipid-lowering uh, treatment despite uh, all of uh, pharmacies and physicians' uh, best efforts. Hyperlipidemia is uh, not the only cause of coronary artery disease, but it's probably the strongest predictor of coronary artery disease, as shown in the literature. And uh, hypercholesterolemia is something which gives additive risk to the non-coronary artery disease risk factors, as you've heard already, uh, cigarette smoking, obesity, hypertension, et cetera, et cetera, including uh, in addition to ECG abnormalities. Just a quick note on ECG, I've, I've underlined it here because a lot of people um, use the acronym ECG or EKG, uh, and they actually do mean the same thing, but um, uh, the, actually the acronym EKG is the German acronym because they spell cardiogram with a K. Um, and so uh, ECG, the ECG was actually an American invention, and the correct acronym in the United States is, uh, is ECG, not EKG. Just for those of you who like the sticklers for grammar. 
Atherosclerosis is responsible for 43% of the U.S. deaths and uh, nearly all heart attacks and 80% of strokes. Um, lipid levels aren't a perfect predictor uh, by themselves, uh, but LDL levels are still considered an independent uh, predictor of morbidity and mortality. So therefore, again, even if you don't know if somebody is hypertensive or a smoker or obese or has diabetes, just the fact that their levels, just one simple uh, laboratory test that tells you their uh, laboratory levels of LDL are elevated are grounds enough to initiate the treatment of some sort. Um, despite what you may think kills most people in the United States, um, more Americans die of coronary artery disease and stroke each year as compared to cancer, accidents, or any other causes. So again, uh, as, as I said in the introductory slides, uh, lipids are a very serious business, and uh, hopefully I've, I've made my point. Depending on the, uh, uh, what kind of different genetic uh, disorder one has, oh, that's not right. There we are. Depending on what kind of a different gen uh, genetic disorder one has, uh, they're going to express a different type of lipid abnormality. Um, uh, type 1 uh, lipid abnormality is going to be elevation in chylomicrons, which is a genetic uh, LPL uh, deficiency. Uh, type 2A, which is going to be the main focus of this lecture, is going to be um, an elevation in LDL cholesterol, also again called the bad cholesterol. And 3B is going to be um, elevation in LDL and VLDL. A VLDL is actually the main carrier uh, apolipoprotein of triglycerides, so you can use them synonymously for the purpose of, of this lecture. Um, there's actually one kind of uh, lipoprotein I haven't listed here. Can anyone tell me what it is? There's six of them. Which one? Who said that? Who, who did? All right, good job. Just because you guys answer the questions correctly here, I want you guys to pay attention because I know you don't get a break and you're full of atherosclerosis, so I'm going to give something away to anyone who answers it correctly. It basically amounts to random things that have made my way into my office uh, and or candy. <laughs> so the next slide is actually an expanded version of uh, the next... Uh, the next slide is an expanded version of what I've uh, made in the previous slide. Um, uh, what I've done here is I've, I've listed uh, um, in the two columns uh, to the right uh, the, uh, the first choice of therapy, of pharmacotherapy, and then the second choice and third choice in the appropriate order. I in some ways, this is, this is a good slide to, that you're going to want to be familiar with because it, in, in some ways it's a summary of the entire lecture that I'm giving you today. Um, in addition, uh, I've also listed the combination therapy if the first, uh, if, uh, the first line treatment um, is intolerable to the patient or they need additional um, pharmacotherapy. And so uh, elevated LDL is the most common and is the, the most atherogenic, so we're going to be focusing on elevations of LDL cholesterol first. Um, increased serum uh, LDL is largely due to increased uh, HMG COA reductase activity and increased HMG COA reductase uh, will produce more cholesterol within the body. Um, it also can be due to a decreased LDL receptor synthesis. Um, the less LDL receptors there are on the liver uh, will mean that plasma LDL will not uh, as readily be taken up and broken down by the liver. Um, the fate of uh, circulating cholesterol uh, can uh, be eliminated uh, within the enterohepatic pool or it can also be uh, eliminated uh, within the stool. And the problem arises when there's excess cholesterol in the body that unmetabolized excess LDL can be oxidized and, accumulating, uh, and accumulate in the uh, arteries as uh, you've seen in Dr. Farb's lecture. And this is something which takes about 40 or 50 years to occur. So when one talks about atherosclerosis, they're really talking about a cholesterol storage disorder. But in addition to being a cholesterol storage disorder, it's equally a disease of, um, of inflammation. Um, and this is something I actually didn't realize until I was partway into my uh, vascular uh, medicine research fellowship. And what happens is a little bit of cholesterol will stick within the coronary arteries. And uh, the body kind of doesn't know exactly what to do with it. And so it treats it, um, uh, it, it treats it kind of as an invader and it produces an inflammatory response. So a little bit of cholesterol will stick there, and then a whole, bot of, a whole bunch of the body's um, uh, inflammation responders will stick to that, including interleukin-6, TNF-alpha. And there, there's, a whole, uh, there's a whole cornucopia of these inflammatory markers. I'm not going to burden you with them all. 
Um, basically, and actually, more, most importantly, because there's no, there's no drug in which to treat them. Uh, one of the things that holds us back in pharmacology right now is all we can really treat um, are, is the lipid production, not the inflammatory response. Now, I know what you're thinking. You know, there's lots of anti-inflammatory drugs you can take out there, naproxen and ibuprofen and aspirin. But uh, it's been shown in studies that those don't quite hit the right kind of inflammation that's, uh, that's caused uh, within the coronary arteries. Um, so yeah, just, uh, just recognize that it's um, that we're really one of the things, one of the problems of why we can't really treat this disease completely is because we're not, we're, not, uh, uh, we're not treating the inflammatory um, uh, component. And a lot, of those, a, lot, a lot of the pictures you see, the cartoon pictures which they show regarding atherosclerosis where they show this, this red coronary artery and then like a thick yellow fatty plaque in the coronary artery is actually really not accurate because it's, uh, it's many, many different kinds of cells uh, that, that cause um, atherosclerosis uh, to occur and accumulate. So in the treatment of hyperlipidemia, um, statins are going to be uh, the best choice. And, uh, but before you initiate statins, I'm, I'm obligated to tell you about that there are therapeutic lifestyle changes which um, have to occur. And I know you guys have already heard about this, so I, I have no intention of, of dwelling on it. Um, but most of them are going to be dietary and exercise in nature, and we'll just leave it at that. Um, if a therapeutic lifestyle change fails, uh, drug therapy would start at any point when LDL levels are above uh, 130 uh, milligrams per deciliter. So why is lowering LDL the primary goal of pharmacotherapy? Uh, well, it's because the LDL carries most of the cholesterol in the body and uh, actually carries uh, somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of the cholesterol that, uh, that goes through your body. Um, and so uh, LDL cholesterol, because it carries that much, is considered to be the best predictor of, um, uh, of death and cerebrovascular uh, events. Um, and the higher, the more coronary artery disease risk factor a patient has, uh, the more stringent of an LDL goal they're going to need. Now, I didn't really emphasize it too much in the slide because I don't want to burden you with too much knowledge from uh, the literature here. But um, th they're actually, some of the strongest pharmacological literature out there involves um, the giving of statins to lower LDL levels and prolong one's life. And um, th there are dozens and dozens of clinical trials which have shown this. Um, and again, it's some of the strongest pharmacol pharmacological literature out there. And those trials involve uh, literally hundreds of thousands of uh, patients. Now, I've already talked to you. You've already heard a lot about the risk factors here, so I'm not going to, again, I'm not going to dwell on this uh, too much either. Um, but of the constellation of risk factors, um, depending on whether you're male or female for HDL cholesterol levels, um, you basically begin treatment. Um, the modifiable risk factors include uh, LDL, where you begin treatment again at 130 milligrams per deciliter. Um, if uh, one has hypertension, type A personality, uh, diabetes, estrogen status, um, you know anyone with a type A personality? Um, <laughs> physical inactivity, um, something called abdominal obesity. Are you familiar with the term abdominal obesity? OK, good. Um, and also cigarette smoking. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off on a little bit of a tangent here with regards to cigarette smoking, because there is a big difference clinically if one were to smoke one cigarette a day and 40 cigarettes a day. But in either case, it's considered to be a risk factor. Um, smoking is actually a very dangerous habit, which counts as an independent risk factor for heart disease. And even if one were to stop smoking completely, it takes three years for the cardiovascular risk to disappear. And the cancer risk um, stays around indefinitely, depending on how the body is able to eliminate the chemicals within cigarettes. Um, smoking is even dangerous to people who don't smoke. Uh, the smoke that comes off the tip of cigarette is more dangerous than the filtered uh, secondhand smoke, which the smoker uh, consumes. Uh, and one study in particular, um, uh, a very poignant study, uh, in Colorado, smoking was banned in all places of business. And two years later, the cardiovascular event rate uh, went down uh, by 30%. Um, and so cigarettes and burning tobacco are a very dangerous substance. And uh, there's an overwhelming um, amount of data which agrees with me on this topic. Anyone has more questions about that, I'm happy to fill their ear after class. And so again, for any kind of lipoprotein disorder, you want to do therapeutic lifestyle changes. And this is stuff you've already heard about. Um, uh, the, the bottom line is it's exercise and diet, like I said. Th these diets, though, really aren't that bad. Um, it's not just a complete awful diet of eating just leaves and tofu all day long. Um, even the American Heart Association allows for um, some, uh, you know, some junk food to be uh, taken in, in the diet. 
Um, does anyone want to guess how much of uh, your diet is allowed to be junk food according to the American Heart Association? Just shout out some numbers. What's that? No, no, no. Do it as a percent of calories over a month. Assume like someone were to have a 2,000 uh, calories per day, so over a month that's 60,000 calories. So what percentage would you think? Wait, who, who said 10? Raise your hand. Who said 10? Who did? There? <laughs> All right, you said 10? All right, you got it. Let's see what I got for you. I have a stock bottle of Lipitor for you, 80 milligrams. It's for you or a hypercholesterolemic friend or family member. And no joke, this bottle it contains 90 pills and it sells for $540.36. Come get it after class. You better get it now, actually. Um, yeah, yeah. Just relax. It's filled with Skittles, so don't worry. So yeah, 10% actually, 10% uh, is actually, it's, it's, a, it's a decent number. The problem is that pe Americans and people who are obese and hypercholesterolemic don't eat junk food in moderation. So if you assume, again, a 2,000 calorie a day diet, um, th that's going to be uh, 6,000 calories a month. But the problem is that people can have those 6,000 calories and just all, they have it all in one day, or they, they have it in a couple of days, and then they, they repeat it again the next day. And so that, that's what the problem is. The problem is moderation. People don't consume the